Disney's water parks are a bit, well, odd. They are, in my opinion, some of the best creations to come out of the Eisner era, serving as some of Disney's best examples of intriguing and engaging theme park design. Yet, they tend to be forgotten and overlooked by the majority of people, never really entering the conversation when discussing the world's best theme parks. Even for the general park-goer population, you never really see people discussing these parks when they plan their vacations to Walt Disney World. So, why is that the case? Well, as we've seen with Universal's Volcano Bay, no matter how good of a park it may be, water parks just simply aren't as popular as their dry counterparts. I have certainly mocked Universal for trying to market this as a full-fledged theme park, when it's clearly not the same type of experience. While wave pools, lazy rivers, rapids, and slides are certainly fun, they just simply cannot achieve the level of show value and theming that you would find with an indoor dark ride. Now of course, that hasn't stopped Universal from creating an impressive, highly themed experience, nor did it stop Disney three decades prior. While the water park industry is certainly profitable and has its market, its numbers come nowhere close to what you'll find with their more traditional counterparts. According to the Themed Entertainment Association, in 2019, Magic Kingdom saw 20.9 million visitors. In comparison, the number one water park in the United States by attendance, Typhoon Lagoon, saw only 2.2 million. This would then be followed by Blizzard Beach at 1.9 million, just trailed by Volcano Bay at 1.8 million. I'm using 2019 estimations because 2021 wasn't a good standard for normal attendance, but I think the contrast is pretty clear. Now of course, Magic Kingdom is the most popular park in the world by a pretty far stretch, as Animal Kingdom followed up with 13 million, Epcot with 12, and Hollywood Studios with 11. Even both of Universal's Florida parks saw around 10 million visitors each, but it's still clear that the water parks can't even begin to touch them. So while Disney's water parks are great, they've just tended to fade into the background and have seen few changes since opening. Now of course, this isn't to say that current Disney management hasn't tried to ruin that theming as they tend to do, as when Blizzard Beach reopened recently, they slapped characters from Frozen into one of the kids' areas. I know that people will write me off as cynical for hating this, but Blizzard Beach has a very specific and interesting story that justifies its theming, and this directly counters that. However, I'll get into more depth on this later. Otherwise though, Disney's water parks seem to be stuck in a strange limbo. Upon entering, it's like taking a step back in time to the 90s, both in the over-the-top theming of both parks, but also in the incredible details you'll witness, elements that you would never dream to see at Disney today. These often forgotten signatures of Eisner and his incredibly strong Imagineering teams allow me to feel as if I'm walking around Disney decades in the past. So come travel back in time with me as we discuss the strange realm of Disney's virtually untouched water parks. Bastions of quintessential 90s theming, but in the absolutely best way possible. While Disney's River Country would open in 1976 at the Fort Wilderness Campgrounds, it was rather quaint in comparison to the parks that would be built later. While the rock work and offerings are interesting, River Country wasn't really anything too ambitious. In my opinion, its reputation grew AFTER it closed in 2001, having sat abandoned until it was demolished a few years ago and cultivating an air of mystery, begging to be explored by those bold enough to do so. While River Country has become a fun part of Disney history, I think that Disney's first contemporary water park, Typhoon Lagoon, completely outshines it. The park would open in 1989, so while not technically the 90s, very much fit the design choices of that era with the over-the-top, in-your-face level of theming. The massive wave pool, which for the time produced unprecedented six-foot swells, would also eventually fit into that late 90s culture of marketing things through recreational sports, as the waves themselves could actually be surfed on. 
Disney actually offers surf lessons for both beginners and the experienced, where you enter the park before it opens to the public. While I can't find any information on whether this was offered post-shutdown, it is still up on the Walt Disney World website. However, even the chance to experience an activity like this is something that distinctly defines that Eisner era. Whether it's fishing around Disney's waterways, driving a race car at the Richard Petty driving experience, diving into the tanks of the Living Seas, or partying at Pleasure Island, the Eisner era at Disney introduced many unique experiences and recreational activities beyond just the theme parks. In fact, another interesting element of Typhoon Lagoon was the Shark Reef. It opens with the park and allowed you to snorkel with sharks, stingrays, and a variety of tropical fish. It definitely felt unique and distinctly Disney, as in you couldn't really find anything like it elsewhere unless you went to the actual ocean. To me, the Disney brand was very much something established in the Eisner era, where any product or experience with the Disney name on it went above and beyond what was expected, often being quite unique. Typhoon Lagoon as a park overall seems to reflect this in both its theming and general design choices. However, the Shark Reef itself would close in 2016, with a former check-in kiosk being turned into an admittedly interesting bar, and the former pool becoming a seating area. Still, it's disappointing that this experience was removed, especially because it was offered as part of admission and not an upcharge. By most accounts, it was incredibly expensive to maintain the pool and take care of the animals, yet it also exemplifies a particular phrase that arose in that era. I'm sure you've heard of the Disney difference, and the Shark Reef is a great example of how much value you could find at the Disney parks. Beyond the surfing and shark encounter reflecting that 90s sentiment of edgy coolness though, Typhoon Lagoon manages to feel very distinctly 90s just through design and theming alone. It just screams Eisner-era imagineering through its use of excessive details, unique elements, and a strong cohesive theme that became the standard for themed entertainment in that decade. Perhaps that may not really make too much sense to you, so let me walk you through the park experience and explain what I mean. By the way, if I've kept you interested or engaged this far into the video, you can really help me out by just simply leaving a like. I've noticed that just asking people to do so as a favor works really well in allowing the video to gain exposure, so if you think I deserve it, I would really appreciate that simple gesture. At the park entrance, you'll encounter a mast buried in concrete meant to look like sand, welcoming you to Typhoon Lagoon. You'll also notice that the design of the ticket windows are all different, ranging from a tropical pavilion to elements of a ship separated from the hull. As you enter the park, the cover over the turnstiles is made up of different ship parts in miscellaneous chunk. Here at the front, you also have an opportunity to take a picture with the park's icon, Laguna Gator, designed to emulate a sand sculpture. As you move further into this tropical paradise, you'll follow a winding path, and if you stick to your right, you'll find yourself on an overlook with mounted telescopes. This reveals the lagoon, anchored visually by a shrimp boat that mysteriously found itself balanced on top of a volcanic mountain. Obviously, this is a pretty unique and interesting visual beacon for the park. In classic Eisner-era fashion, the park also has a cohesive story and theme that ties everything together, and the detail used to do so is both clever and nuanced. First, let me say that I think that designing the entry pathway to wind around carefully landscaped foliage leading to the big reveal, is a great design choice. Disney's parks don't have a lot of vertical height to them, but as with the reveal of Discovery Island and Animal Kingdom, Typhoon Lagoon also manages to make everything feel much larger and exciting, both through the forced perspective of the volcano with the boat, as well as with the scope of the reveal. It's an incredible design choice that works extremely well, but is never really talked about, so I wanted to highlight it here. As for the story of the park, it's rather straightforward. For as long as anyone could remember, this harbor existed with a small village perched alongside it. However, with the turn to the 20th century, the spot was discovered by tourists and cruise ships, which resulted in the creation of the Placid Palms Resort. However, one day, an unforeseen typhoon rolled in, 
causing absolute mayhem for a brief hour and throwing about everything at the resort. Once it passed, a furious mess was left behind, which accounts for much of the debris in the shrimp boat, known as the Miss Tilly, perched precariously on top of the volcano. Every half an hour, the volcano will attempt to dislodge the Miss Tilly using its geyser. I'm sure you noticed, but the sound palette itself is also rather cartoony, which lends a lot to the almost whimsical iconography of the park. The storm also changed the physical landscape of the harbor, whether it be through moving land or causing debris to reroute water. This resulted in waterfalls and pools, as well as cutting off the harbor from the ocean and renaming it after the curious event as Typhoon Lagoon. What makes Typhoon Lagoon and Blizzard Beach unique though, is that the attractions themselves fit directly into the landscapes of the parks. These slides themselves are not just simply water park slides, but are diegetic, meaning that they are a direct element of the story themselves. With the typhoon creating new water features, the inhabitants decided to create makeshift paths up the mountain, bringing you to the top of these new waterways that you can use to slide down back to the lagoon. The slides on the mountain are designed with long, meandering pathways that allow you to feel as if you're exploring and trekking up the mountain, going out of their way to be longer than necessary. Still, while not getting you to the slides quickly, this design choice really provokes the feeling of embarking on an adventure, and discovering interesting elements the further up you go. Another example of the park's commitment to theming is when you get to the top of the pathway for an attraction known as the Storm Slides. This is the closest you will be able to get to the Miss Tilly, and it feels rewarding to see it up close because of the curiosity it sparked long before you got to this point when it was first revealed. However, as the boat is blocking a geyser from erupting out of the top, the water spills down from under the boat and into the actual queue itself, feeding into the slides. It's a nice immersive touch and is an example of clever Disney theming that you'll no longer see. Imagineering seems really committed to creating this fun, immersive environment that serves that story as realistically as it can. Another example of this would be the wave pool. It appears that the rocks surrounding the lagoon have been dammed up for whatever reason. Usually, a water effect will have nozzles spraying water out of the wood to make it seem as if the dam is about to break, and my assumption is that the occasional massive wave is meant to portray this event. I'm glad to say though that with further updates to the park, this immersive design philosophy would be faithfully adhered to. The first example of this was the Crushing Gusher, which is a water coaster introduced in 2005. Traveling up the stairs and through a themed, dilapidated fruit processing plant, guests have the choice of choosing one of three chutes used to transport the fruit down into the pool below. Finally, the most recent addition to the park was Misadventure Falls, added in 2017. The story of the attraction is that Mary Oceaneer, a sea captain and member of the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, went down in a diving bell to search for treasure along the ocean floor. After resurfacing, her ship was hit by the typhoon and everything was scattered about. The riders themselves enter rafts, aiming to help her search for the lost treasure. On entering the lift hill for the cargo transport, you can encounter Mary's parrot named Salty, who instructs you to report on any treasure you may see on the way down. While it's cool that the slide has an animatronic, more often than not it appears to not be working and is covered up. Still, this is a quality family raft ride that manages to be quite fun as you move through the jungle. Hopefully I've made the point that through both the immersive theming of the different attractions and the various shops and eateries, Typhoon Lagoon manages to act as a signature creation from the incredibly strong Imagineering teams of the Eisner era. Think about all the different elements that came together to create such a uniquely detailed space, all working to reinforce a cohesive story. It embraces the shipwreck theme by mixing the island architecture with seafaring debris, 
incorporates its slides directly into the story, and offers elements that feel distinctly unique and Disney that reflect the best of Eisner's Imagineers. It's a truly incredible park with an immense amount of thought put into it, and I'm glad to say that Blizzard Beach continues this level of thoughtful design as well. While I really like Blizzard Beach quite a lot, I think that most people will agree with me that it's easily the weaker of the two parks. This is apparent from the entrance, which fits the theme of the Florida Ski Lodge, but lacks the detail that defines the front of Typhoon Lagoon. Opening in 1995, Blizzard Beach seems to have been a response to really strong demand for Typhoon Lagoon, and I'm glad to see it take its theme in a uniquely different direction. As you'll notice, the Ski Lodge theming defines the entry area, and here you will spot clues that reveal the story behind the park. You can see melting snowdrifts and icicles near the buildings alongside skiing equipment. If you look to your right, you'll notice a sign warning you of a low-flying gator, an allusion to this park's mascot whose name is Ice. If you look to your left at the beach house, you'll notice a comedic gag. Walking forward out of this area, you'll notice a snow family dressed up as Disney tourists and melting in the Florida sun. Behind them will be the big reveal of Mount Gushmore, which I believe is just as iconic as Typhoon Lagoon's Miss Tilly, but is certainly less dramatic in its reveal. Blizzard Beach abandons the sense of adventure you will find at Typhoon Lagoon, and its story is more straightforward. It too begins with a freak storm, this time bringing winter winds and snow to Florida. Having quickly covered this area with snow, investment was quickly made to convert this area into Florida's first ski resort, building ski slopes, toboggan slides, and a ski lift to bring people up the mountain. However, just as quickly as it came, the snow began to melt and the dream of the resort vanished. Yet, as snow turned to slush and began to run down the mountain, investors witnessed an alligator sliding down and splashing into the newly formed pools below. Back in business, Blizzard Beach would open to the public, with its ski resort converted into a melting snowy water park. Like Typhoon Lagoon, Blizzard Beach is full of fun and interesting elements that allow its theme to really shine. For example, the ski lift is a great way to get to the slides at the top of the mountain, and is one of those distinct Imagineering signatures of the Eisner era. Disney didn't have to do this, but it's a really fun and cleverly thematic way of immersing people into the story. Now of course, you can take a winding pathway of stairs up to the top, which in itself is worth it for the scenic views. In fact, once you actually reach the top, you're going to find some unique views of other areas of Walt Disney World. Part of what distinguishes Blizzard Beach isn't just the theme, but rather the types of slides as well. In comparison to Typhoon Lagoon, these slides are taller and faster, allowing this park to be more appropriate for thrill seekers. This is best exemplified with the park's two tallest slides, the Slush Gusher and Summit Plummet. Another detail to note is that when riders drop down Summit Plummet, a gag occurs where a water effect will make it look as if they have flown off of a ski ramp. It's stupid and funny, but also another distinct detail that would have only occurred under Eisner-era Imagineering. Another detail you'll notice here up on the mountain is the various snow machines, trying to keep the mountain perpetually snowy. One of my favorite attractions here is Teamboat Springs, the world's longest family raft ride, which has you sliding down what I presume to be a snowmobile race course. What makes it unique is not just its length, but rather that it makes an effort to be immersive. Once you reach the end of the slide portion, you're dumped into a slow-moving river where you'll float along gently, taking in the scenery as you float through an abandoned shack. It's a small, very distinctly Disney detail that serves to reinforce the story of the park as a melting ski resort. The slow floating portion almost seems trivial, but it's just so unique because only Disney would have bothered to do this. While we're continuing to talk about details, let me quickly list a few more. Throughout the park, you'll find snow flurries that add a great deal to the atmosphere. In the Ski Patrol training camp, the theming has resulted in some really interesting attractions for kids, including walking and balancing on melting ice sheets, as well as a themed zipline. In the lazy river towards the back of the park, there's a neat ice cave, and on some of the walls, you can find comedic graffiti engraved into them. 
However, as much as I like the park, I do have to mention some negatives. First, is that while the back of the park behind the mountain is nicely landscaped, a lot of the ski resort theming just isn't present. Thematically, it's a bit boring back there other than the occasional prop. Second, is that while the wave pool known as Meltaway Bay has great theming as a backdrop, the waves themselves are pretty standard, and the pool is significantly smaller than the one at Typhoon Lagoon. Thirdly, recent Disney leadership has made a poor update to the park that I just simply cannot agree with. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but Tyke's Peak has a new retheme of an area aimed at toddlers. It features Frozen characters such as Anna, Elsa, Kristoff, Sven, and Olaf, as well as Snowgees dotted around the place. Yes, I understand that this area is meant for toddlers and is relatively off to the side, but I think I've done a good job of establishing that the park has a strong theme that ties all of its creative decisions together. Like most other creative decisions these days, Disney leadership can only resort to surface level character inclusion because they don't respect the intellectual capacity of their guests. Granted, that must sound ridiculous because the key demographic here is toddlers, but there are plenty of other creative avenues that Disney could have taken to update this area. I think that the Ski Patrol Camp is a great example of this. If the Frozen update to Tyke's Peak was a one-off thing, then I might be willing to forgive it, but it's definitely a component of a larger trend from Disney leadership who care so little for their park experiences that they're willing to destroy thematic cohesion. This was one of Disney's top strengths that allowed their parks to stand above their competition, but now having resorted to just shoving in easily identifiable characters in inappropriate places, it feels intellectually cheap. As if, I don't know, Six Flags was running the show. I know that some people might try to write me off as overreacting, but this stuff really matters because it is so distinctly off-brand from what Disney has traditionally been. That Disney difference was focusing on the small details and elements, making sure that they made sense within the story that you were telling. Both Blizzard Beach and Typhoon Lagoon are some of the best, but also seemingly forgotten examples of what Disney Imagineering had to offer. For as much as I've spoken about both of these parks already, I have some really interesting points I would still like to share. Earlier in the intro for the video, I did make the point that stepping into these parks feels like stepping back in time. When you walk in, you can just feel the power of Imagineering from that era, and it feels as if Eisner were still CEO. I know it's just the nostalgia talking, but to me, it's like traveling back in time to the 90s or the early aughts. Now granted, this doesn't make any thematic sense for the park, but you can definitely hear a power line, as in the Michael Jackson-inspired character from a Goofy movie, going towards the front of Blizzard Beach. I've already discussed a lot of the visual details that allow these parks to feel distinctly 90s, but their signature is felt through the other senses as well. While we're on the topic of music in Blizzard Beach, I do want to also point out that in certain sections along the Lazy River, you can hear the cue music from the Matterhorn bobsleds. It's just, well, stupid and funny, but reflects the humor of Disney in 1995. Otherwise though, Blizzard Beach's music is appropriately either Calypso, Surf Rock, and sometimes not appropriately, random Disney songs which I actually don't like. I don't see why it was necessary or thematically appropriate to play songs from Coco in a park like this. In contrast, Typhoon Lagoon also seems to focus on a lot of Calypso and Surf Rock, but also on orchestral versions of what I believe are sea shanties. I did also notice one distinct musical element of the Eisner era, jazz. It might seem like a weird fit for Typhoon Lagoon, but I definitely heard it while walking up to the big reveal. Jazz found itself everywhere in the parks under Eisner, especially in Disney MGM Studios, so it's also great to hear it in a place that feels stuck in that era. As far as I can remember, I didn't hear any Disney film songs in this park, though I wasn't really looking out for them. Another sensory element I haven't yet mentioned is scent. Throughout Typhoon Lagoon, there is very much a distinct fruity smell that reminds me heavily of bananas or coconut which I'm assuming is the intent. 
Throughout Blizzard Beach, especially in the ice cave that the Lazy River runs through, there is also a sense that I can't quite place either. It reminds me a bit of fresh pine, but I think it's supposed to be a bit more generic, smelling more fresh and representing either snow or ice in some abstract manner. Sensory effects are definitely something that Eisner's Imagineers were far more interested in, and the only recent examples I can think of are on Flight of Passage and Sword Around the World. Finally, there has been a long-standing myth that while heated, the water at Blizzard Beach was kept at a cooler temperature than at Typhoon Lagoon. As far as I can determine, there is no evidence to suggest that this is true, but it feeds into the old reputation of the Disney difference, adding unnecessary detail just because they could, which is why I think it's so widely believed. Disney's water parks, at least thematically, just cannot be matched. While Volcano Bay is great in its own way, and is certainly more appealing to certain demographics with its larger and more intense slides, it just lacks that dedication to story that you'll find in Disney water parks. While I've certainly seen a lot of advertisements for these parks recently, they still seem to often feel forgotten, even by the most dedicated of Disney fans. That's a large part of why I wanted to make this video, because I wanted to remind people that these are some of the best examples of Disney Imagineering, not just from the Eisner era, but through the entire history of the company. Entering Typhoon Lagoon or Blizzard Beach, you immediately notice the difference, as if you had stepped back in time right to the 90s. These parks were distinctly Disney, not because of whatever franchise they owned that they could throw at you, but because they wanted to offer unique experiences such as the Shark Reef, or wanted to have fun with small but impactful elements such as the Summit Plummet Ski Slope Gag. In a time where I am increasingly losing interest with Disney creatively, their essentially untouched water parks stand as a reminder of the Disney standard that built the reputation that they're currently coasting off of. So, to wrap everything up, all I can say is that if you watched this far into the video, I would like to hear your opinion on these parks. Whether you want to tell me which park you prefer, whether you disagree with my hatred for Tyke's Peak, or if you agree that these are interesting expressions of Imagineering stuck in time, I think that there's a lot that can be discussed here. As always though, you can really do me a favor by leaving a like on the video. If you enjoy stuff like this but haven't yet subscribed and hit the bell icon, I strongly recommend doing that as well, so as to be notified to new videos as they release.